Hello, my name is Dr. Fallon Lee. I use she and her pronouns, and what we're going to go over today is parts of a different workshop called Life Hack, Going Home for Breaks, and hopefully after today's workshop and learning a little bit more about different things to consider when traveling home for break, when maybe that's stressful, you can feel better prepared for extended stays back home. Our overview today is really going to focus on four different categories of information to best help out for transitioning back home. First, we're going to work to identify hot topics or trigger areas. Then we'll talk a little bit about different emotion regulation skills. After that, we'll transition into talking about distress tolerance skills, which are things to do when that stress reaches a level that's truly distress. And lastly, we'll talk a little bit about boundaries and assertive communication skills. I'd like to take a moment here to say that while I do have some expertise on healthy communication, family dynamic patterns, emotion regulation, and distress tolerance, that you're the expert on you and your family. I also want to acknowledge that traveling home can be really painful for some. So the aim of this presentation is not to pass blame or judgment. It's not to say by any means that we deserve treatment that might be harmful or hurtful, past experiences of trauma or abuse. Hopefully this presentation can give you skills to keep yourself emotionally safe in environments where sometimes that's really hard to do. All right, so let's get started. When thinking about transitions home for break, whether those are plan points in the semesters or unexpected situations like we might find ourselves in now for the COVID-19 pandemic, it's important to take a moment to really identify if going home or traveling back to a home environment is making you antsy, where do you think that's coming from? Take a second to really think about and parse out what are the different elements of traveling home that feel stressful or distressing. We can think about these as potential triggers. And now I know that word can be used a lot. And so when I'm using it today in this workshop, I'm using it in this scope. So when thinking about triggers, these are stimuli that can contribute to an unwanted emotion or action. These are situations, people, even different emotional states. So when thinking about what these potential triggers could be, it's important to think about what some hot topics might be. What can we anticipate that might be a struggle? Maybe it's changes that you've gone through since coming to college. Maybe parts of your identity or belief system. Maybe it's the political landscape. Maybe it's your performance in class. Maybe it's the expectation to work eight to five on schoolwork when that may be shifting and changing. So for a second, think about what some cool, warm, and hot conversation topics or situations could be for you and your family. What are some things that feel easy to talk about? These could be things like media or sports. These could be simple small talk things like the weather or maybe past experiences that you've shared. And then what are some conversations or situations that start to feel a little bit more warm? Water that maybe feels uncomfortable to wade in for a longer period of time. This could be interactions with specific family members. This could also be maybe watching the news and then what are conversation topics or situations that feel really hot, that feel unsafe to touch on or stay on for a long period of time? If you're having trouble thinking about what cool, warm, and hot conversations or situations are, think about what you might notice about yourself, physical feelings associated with distress, Things like increased heart rate, rapid breathing, maybe it's different emotional states. You notice your temper rising and you start to get more anxious. It could be also specific locations or settings. Maybe areas of your house or hometown have really strong memories and really strong negative associations associated with that. So to think about some of these different cool, warm, and hot topics and situations. 
Now, this isn't necessarily an invitation to dwell and ruminate on them, but more a chance to name and honor them as part of a human experience that many people have. When thinking about triggers, we first want to know what the problem is. If I'm exposed to one of these triggering situations or conversation topics, what's the worst case scenario? Let's get really real and honest with ourselves about what could happen if we're exposed to this. Is it an increased um, feeling of depression or anxiety? Is it maybe feeling like we have less control over our actions or our emotional reactions? And then to also, again, think about ourselves. So what are different things that could be triggering for us? And some different ways of kind of breaking that into different categories, again, so we can go in fully prepared, right? Let's have this knowledge. Let's really think about not only what is impacting me, but what are the different component parts of this too? The second part of this worksheet gives you a chance to really describe these triggers or these different activating situations in detail. What would happen physiologically, emotionally, or in my environment? Then is there a way to avoid or reduce exposure? Again, these could be if you're finding yourself wading into a hot conversation, can I change the topic? If I really don't want to go to a certain area of town or to a certain store, is there a way that I could stay home or avoid parts of that? And then the last section is a strategy for if we're faced with this, how can I deal with it head on? Now you might be really kind of scratching your head at this, right? Well, I don't really know what to do. Well, hopefully here in the next couple slides, we'll talk about some different strategies you can use to feel more in control if and when we do need to face a triggering situation or environment head on. If you'll humor me with a little bit of a side note here, what do you do if you're on fire? Well, it's already on here and hopefully we already know, but you're supposed to stop, drop, and roll. Now, we all learned this when we were in elementary school, maybe. Maybe it was a day with a local fire department or a video that we saw, but we didn't learn it when we were on fire. Because if we're on fire and someone shouts at us, hey, just stop, drop, and roll, that's not going to make any sense because that's not something we're familiar with that doesn't feel natural in that moment. So when we talk about different kinds of coping skills, specifically emotion re regulation skills, it's really important to practice these things before we need them. That way, when we're in these distressing situations, a la if we were on fire, we would know what to do and how to handle them. So as we're talking through these, try to set aside some intentional time throughout the week to practice these new skills. This could be before or after a meal. This could be either waking up in the morning and going to bed, a time where maybe our systems are pretty relaxed, where we're not really stressed out. It's important to know that all of these skills might not work for everyone, and that's okay. And I suggest that you modify these as needed to be more effective for you. With any of these emotion regulation skills and with stressful times in general, it's important to set yourself up for success beforehand as much as you're able to. For this, we think about the acronym PLEASE, which mostly works with a little bit of creative thinking on the first one. So noticing physical illness and treating that as you're able to. Eating healthy food and fueling your body. Avoiding mood-altering drugs. This does not mean not taking medication that's been prescribed, but knowing that depressants like alcohol and marijuana and stimulants can affect our bodies and emotions in really notable ways. Sleeping well, and there's resources on the Student Counseling Center's website about sleep hygiene, and exercising as you're able to. When you're able to do things, you're able to better connect with your body physically and you're setting yourself up for a lot of internal success for handling external stressors. One emotion regulation skill that could be quite helpful is to act the opposite. Now this one inherently sounds and is really counterintuitive to what we're feeling, but it's basically working to kind of throw our emotions out of alignment intentionally. Now, when you're experiencing an emotion, the behavior that usually comes with it matches. If you're angry, you might want to fight or argue. If you're sad, you might want to kind of draw away and kind of keep yourself apart from others. However, doing the opposite action can help to change the emotion and to make it less distressing. So for example, if you're feeling really sad and your instinct is to withdraw from friends, you might lean against that. 
gently push back on that feeling and try reaching out to others more. Try to set up a FaceTime or phone call. Try to reach out to those who you're able to do so safely. If you're feeling really angry and you want to yell or fight or argue, really challenging yourself and your system to talk quietly and behave politely. Now, this isn't to say behaving submissively or dismissively of your own emotion, but to push back on the aspects of that emotion that can be unhelpful or challenging. One of the trickiest things about our emotions and our emotional experiences is that while our emotions are always valid, they're not always accurate. And I encourage you to sit with that for a second. My emotions are always valid, but they're not always accurate. When we think about at a base level why we experience emotion, a lot of theorists say it's ingrained from a standpoint of keeping us safe, of how to navigate things in our environment. We experience joy to seek those things out more. We experience fear to avoid situations that could put us in danger or in harm's way. So while our feelings are always valid, they're not always accurate. And so it can be helpful to kind of think back and gently check in with ourselves. What event actually triggered the emotion? What interpretation or assumption am I making about the event? And does my intensity and the emotion itself match the situation? Or does it just match the assumptions or the prejudgment I have about that situation? Now, this can be really challenging to do, especially in the moment. This is one of those things that can be helpful to practice doing retrospectively. Let me try this out on an emotion or a time that felt really hot a couple weeks ago or a couple days ago. Another emotion regulation skill is really practicing gratitude. It's easy when we're stressed out or in negative situations to dwell on negative events or negative moments. But it's really important to pay attention to positive events. Now, that's not to say that everything is going to be sunshine and roses all the time. But it is important to recognize the things that are going well, even if they're small. You might think about trying to cultivate more positive experiences as your home. And it might be important to scale these down into achievable ways. Did you connect with a friend on social media today in a way that was positive? Did you have a really good gaming session? Did you notice a dog that was really cute on your walk in the neighborhood? Or did you accomplish something for an online class that felt really important? When you're able to pay attention to positive events, it helps reframe and reshape your mind so you can notice more of them more often. When we're talking about distress tolerance skills, they're distinct and different from emotion regulation skills. Now, these are to use in situations where maybe some of the skills we talked about previously aren't accessible. Think about them like survival skills. You're facing an emotional crisis and need something that's going to work really quickly and really effectively. One thing that feels really accessible for a lot of folks is to remember tip skills. Now, what are those? On this slide, you can see it stands for TIP. So tipping the temperature of your face and your hands with cold water. Now it sounds kind of odd, but if you take a few moments and run your hands under really cold water, and maybe you're able to take a towel or kind of gently splash some of that on your face, it really works to kind of ground folks back to the here and now and can help to lower our body temperature, which for some people can increase actually when we're feeling really emotionally activated. The I stands for intense exercise of approximately 20 minutes. This could be putting on a playlist and kind of really aggressively dancing it out. It could be going on a short run or even trying to do some push-ups or sit-ups. When you have a lot of excess energy in your body, when you're in a distressed state, trying to find something to do with that can be really helpful. The last letter in this stands for both paced breathing as well as paired muscle relaxation. So I wanna take a moment and kind of lead us through a breathing exercise. So try to get comfortable wherever you're listening or reading from. Start to notice your breath. Start to notice how you're feeling, if you're holding tension anywhere. I'm gonna lead us through an exercise called square breathing. We're going to breathe in, hold, 
exhale and hold that absence of air. Go ahead and inhale. One, two, three, hold. One, two, three, exhale. One, two, three, hold. One, two, three, inhale. Hold, exhale, hold. Do this a few more times on your own. Now take a moment to check back in with yourself. How are you feeling? Do you notice yourself feeling more or less relaxed? Did you notice maybe your heart rate slow down? Paced breathing is something that works fairly quickly for a lot of people. Think about it like adding coolant to an overheating engine. You can also work to use some paired or progressive muscle relaxation. There are handouts for this available online as well as at the Student Counseling Center website. Progressive muscle relaxation works to hold tension and focus in different parts of our bodies and then breathe through that and let that go. It can have a really calming and soothing effect. And these are three emotion, um, excuse me, distress tolerance skills that can be incredibly helpful and accessible for when we need them. Another distress tolerance skill that can be really helpful when applied is this idea of radical acceptance. So I really want to break this down for a little bit because oftentimes when we think about the word acceptance, we think about liking something or really leaning into it. But what radical acceptance is, is really coming to terms with the fact that there are some situations that we can't change. It doesn't mean that we condone them or we're excited about them or we love them. It just means that we have to take things as they are. Let's read through this example together and I'll allow you some space to really read through the upper blurb about radical acceptance. So let's say we're in a situation and you found out that you were not the best candidate for a job where you felt like you were. And you might think to yourself, well, that's not fair. I did everything right. I was the best one that there was. Um, they can't do this to me. Now, of course, it makes sense to feel that way and to think those things. And that's not the most helpful thought in that moment. It can create a lot of distress for us. Radical acceptance would be taking that and turning it on its head a little bit. It's frustrating that I didn't get the job, but I can accept that they felt someone else would be better for it. It doesn't mean we like that there might be someone else who's better suited for the job or that we're not sad that we lost out on the opportunity. But again, it's a healthier way of thinking about distressing situations instead of wishing and hoping and spending a lot of energy into trying to change things we can't. It's taking a big breath in, letting that breath out, and accepting things as they are. Using our senses to engage in self-soothing behavior can also be really helpful in times of emotional distress and when we need to practice distress tolerance. So finding pleasurable, healthy, and happy ways to engage in each of your five senses Going for a walk and paying attention to nice things. If you're unable to do that, looking around your environment and finding things that are visually appealing. Maybe it's art that a friend made or a poster of a band that you really enjoy. Hearing, listening to a good band or a good song that you like, listening to a favorite podcast, hearing sounds out in nature. Touch as a self-soothe can also be really important. Sometimes we might not have the resources to take a warm bath or get a massage, but to stretch our bodies, to let go of tension, to put on a favorite sweatshirt or a favorite outfit and notice how that feels. Having a small treat, not having to be a full meal, but maybe there is a tea that you really enjoy or you know, there's a little bit of extra dessert in the fridge or something like that. Using your taste to really pay attention to what that's like, letting that kind of wash over you and being there for it. Smell could be finding a perfume or a cologne that you really enjoy, 
um, you know, as different seasons are upon us, there can be different smells in nature that we might really enjoy. So taking time to really dial into our senses and use those to give ourselves a sense of joy. The last set of distress tolerance skills that I want to talk through y'all with is this idea of distracting via the ACCEPTS acronym. So this is a little bit longer, so I'll walk through some parts of it. This idea that we can do things to help those negative feelings wash through, right? We can't necessarily change a negative situation, but we can distract ourselves in healthy ways. One of those could be looking for different activities that require thought and concentration. This might be coloring an elaborate page or trying to solve a complicated mental puzzle. Contributing, so finding something or someone other than yourself that you can contribute to. This could be spending time or donating resources to a local nonprofit. It could be helping out a family member with something pouring some energy into something that will let you have a sense of contributing to something larger than yourself. Engaging in healthy comparisons. This one can be slippery because we don't necessarily want to make a lot of negative social comparisons, but thinking about your situation and remembering a time where maybe you were in more distress, where things would have been more difficult, where maybe you didn't have a lot of coping tools, and so thinking about that and remembering where am I at now and how am I handling it? Maybe better than how I would have in the past. Emotions. So doing an activity that creates a competing emotion. So I'm feeling really sad about the fact that maybe I don't get to see my friends for a significant amount of time. Or maybe there have been important events coming up that are canceled. So what can I do that would give me a sense of happiness or a sense of joy? Maybe it's creating an alternative virtual celebration. Maybe it's playing a game that I really enjoy. Maybe it's listening to soothing music or engaging in some of those other sensory soothing activities. Pushing away. So again, this idea for distress tolerance, we're in a crisis state. So pushing away some of those negative thoughts. Imagine writing your problem on a piece of paper, crumbling it and throwing it away. Or actually doing that to help create some distance between yourself and the thoughts about the distressing situation. Thoughts, again, so when we're in these states and our emotions feel really strong, using our thoughts to help balance some of that out. Counting to 10, reciting a poem, reading a book, kind of giving our mind and our thoughts something else to focus on other than the situation. And again, sensations. So we've talked about this before in the previous slide, but really finding a way to distract your intense negative emotions um, by using physical sensations. So for some people, this could be, I'm going to hold an ice cube in my hand and really focus on how cold that feels. Um, I might eat a really sour candy or sour piece of fruit and really notice that sensation, kind of how that can take over your focus. So read through this slide and think about different things that you could apply in this ACCEPTS acronym. I'd like to wrap up our time together today by talking about boundaries and assertive communication. It makes a lot of sense that if we're thinking about approaching our emotions in a new way, it means that we're also going to think about our relationships with other people in a new way. Also, this whole presentation was about traveling home, right, and spending more time at break. So, when we're thinking about this, it means that our relationships with other people could be triggering, could be distressing, or might need a little bit of an adjustment. So when we're thinking about boundaries, it feels important to name that these um, can be instrumental to having space to regulate your own emotions and to make sense of the world around you. These aren't the same as walls, though, or barriers. Now, I, as a therapist, love a good boundary, and I recognize that people have different relationships with them. Boundaries are kind of like rules when playing a board game. We need to know what they are so that we can play the right way. Right? And when we're thinking about our relationship, boundaries can be there to help others know how to interact with us, and so we know how to interact with them. And when we're working on assertive communication, it's a way of being able to communicate that boundary, as well as other information about us, in a way that is both forthright um, and firm without maybe being harsh or without being too passive. So it's important to name that there are going to be a lot of different cultural considerations that go into boundaries and assertive communication. What boundaries and communication look like for me and for you or for your friends and family are likely going to look really different. 
And so to think about how you might want to change these and to know that this is a new or different way of approaching a familiar situation or relationship. And that with any change comes adjustment and reactions, both for yourself and for other people. So patience could be a really important part of this process. But let's start first with talking about boundaries and how it could be helpful to set some. When talking about boundaries, I think having a visual aid can be really important for just how we think about our boundaries and relationships with others. So here you'll see a star at the very center of the slide. That's you. For all intents and purposes here in the next slide, you are the star, you are in the middle, you are involved and important in all of your relationships. Now you'll notice three circles slowly fading in. And you'll notice that the space between these circles kind of gets larger and larger the farther out from the star it gets. Now when we're thinking about boundaries and relationships, the people here in this first circle, you might think of very literally as your inner circle. These are your people. These are folks who are going to know a lot about you. What's something that maybe only a handful of people know? that you only trust a few people with. Those are gonna be the people in this circle. This next ring out, these are gonna be folks that know a little bit more about you, but not everything. These might be close friends. These might be trusted professors or your advisor, maybe members of your family. The last circle out are gonna be folks maybe more in an acquaintance category someone you knew your first year in college who was maybe on your dorm floor, an acquaintance who you've had in several classes that you can comfortably make small talk with. And everything outside of that circle, those might be people waiting for the sci ride. Those might be folks at Hy-Vee when you're checking out to get groceries. You'll notice that there's space for movement between the different layers of these circles. And it can be really exciting to bring someone in, to become really close with someone, to share information with them. And it can be equally painful to move someone out of that circle once trust has been broken or violated in some way. So when thinking about boundaries and thinking about home, oftentimes when we're younger, we might feel like our parents are really in that circle, or our siblings are. Yet as we grow and as we become adults, different things happen that can create some distance and some space there. It's actually a fairly normal and shared experience. Now, where conflict can arise if, if, is if you've positioned someone in a boundary in one of these circles that they don't agree with. Maybe they want to be further in. So how can you kind of say, no, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable talking about this topic. I'm really comfortable talking about classes, but talking about my grades in particular, that's kind of challenging. Maybe I'm comfortable talking about my friends, and that feels really good, but only my inner circle really know about people I might be dating, right? So take a few moments to think not only about the people who might fit within these different levels and these different circles, but to also think about the kinds of information you feel comfortable letting them have. After you're done, pay attention to maybe where it feels like everyone's on the inside or everyone's on the outside. This is a space where we can make adjustments because it's very normal and in a lot of ways really healthy to have people and information different across these circles. This can help us out when we're thinking about how to assertively communicate as well. When talking about boundaries, I think having a visual aid can be really important for just how we think about our boundaries and relationships with others. So here you'll see a star at the very center of the slide. That's you. For all intents and purposes here in the next slide, you are the star, you are in the middle, you are involved and important in all of your... Lastly, when we're thinking about assertive communication, there are a few things that can help us feel more assertive and be a little bit more assertive in our communication. To be able to clearly state our wants and needs, to maintain eye contact, to listen to others without interruption, though that can be really challenging, to try to maintain what might be an appropriate speaking volume for the setting, using a steady tone of voice and confident body language. Remember to respect yourself and express your thoughts and feelings calmly. Think about planning what you're going to say and also to say no when you need to. 
Below are some different examples of assertive communication, and you might think about different times when you're home where you might need to call on assertive communication. Game plan these out. Take some time and write them down or practice them when you're by yourself. Thank you so much for joining me virtually for this workshop, and I just wanted to share some crisis resources with you. Here at Iowa State Student Counseling Services, during our remote instruction period, all of our services are being offered by the phone. You can contact our main line, 515-294-5056 to get started, and we're open every day, Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, when campus is open. You could also call the Disaster Distress Line. This offers 24-7 crisis counseling and support. You could use the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline or their online chat. Texting the 24-hour crisis line. If you're an ISU student, we ask that you text ISU to 741741. You can also go to the emergency room if you're becoming immediately concerned for your ability to keep yourself or others safe or calling the Iowa State Police Department if you're here in Ames and a student, or your local police department back home. If there is an immediate threat to your safety or the safety of others, please contact 911 for access to emergency resources. Thank you so much. Go Cyclones, and we hope to see you again sometime.